What's up, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of Game Nights. This show is brought to you by Wizards of the Coast. We have a really exciting episode for you today. We are playing with the Commander Precons from Forgotten Realms, and we have two amazing guests. Joe Manganello, Woo! the actor and D&D expert, along with host and gamer extraordinaire Becca Scott. And of course, in these Precons, you're going to see some amazing cards, and if you want to pick them up and play them against your friends, well, there's no better place than going to cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's our affiliate link. All you have to do is type it into your browser or phone and blammo. You are at the place to buy magic cards, singles, sealed products, and more. You're going to buy magic cards anyway, so why not pick it up and support the show you love at the same time? Yeah, Card Kingdom really does get you your stuff the fastest and in the best condition. Yep. And another way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. You know, patrons get all kinds of cool perks for joining our community, and one of those perks is getting to watch things like Extra Turns and Game Nights. Ooh earlier than the general public. Nice. That's right. The patrons are not here right now because they <laughs> already saw this before you did. Very awesome. Yeah. We really do thank our patrons. Patreon.com slash Command Zone. You know, if we have provided you over the years with any amount of entertainment through Game Nights, Extra Turns, our podcast, it really, we're not asking a lot. Even mm -hmm. just a dollar a month really does help support all of our content and everything we do here. Yeah, absolutely. And it lets us also do cool things like giveaways. In fact, if you want to find out how to win a bunch of awesome swag, including signed playmats from Joe Manganello and Becca Scott. And us. And us. Make sure you stick around till the end of the episode to find out how you could win. Win. But first, you gotta find out who wins this episode of Game Nights. Oh, that's a really good point. Let's get L into it. Let's do it. How's it, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Game Nights. On this one, we're playing with the Forgotten Realms Commander Precons. So, of course, we had to get one of the biggest Dungeons & Dragons experts that we know, Joe Manganello. You might recognize Joe from stuff like True Blood, Magic Mike, Spider-Man, and Zack Snyder's Justice League. I'm Joe, and you might know me from all of that acting stuff, but some of the things you might not know is that I've worked hand-in-hand -hand with Dungeons & Dragons for many years now, working with the marketing department. I also wrote part of one of the modules and created a bunch of characters that are now in canon. Also, three years ago, I created a heavy metal fantasy-themed streetwear line called Death Saves, and I'm here to test out the new Death and we have a brand new friend who's on the show for her very first time. What's up, everybody? I'm Becca Scott. I'm an actor and a host. You may know me from Geek and Sundry, doing the How to Play series for board games, part of the coverage team for the Magic the Gathering Mythic Championships. I also play D&D for the Black Dice Society on the D&D channel, and I'm excited to be here for my very first time on Game Nights. Today, we are embarking on an epic campaign with the newest pre-constructed commander decks from Magic's latest set, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. This is a thing that gamers have been waiting for for decades. I'm talking about all the cool characters you know and love from the Forgotten Realms world, along with the mythic and legendary items from Dungeons and Dragons in a game of Magic. Today, I will be playing Vrondis, Rage of Ancients. <laughs> The goal of this deck is to play cards that can deal damage to my own creatures, which will let Vrondis create a ton of dragons with that enrage ability. Now there's also some cards in there that let me roll dice, so I can keep cranking out those dragon tokens. And eventually become the Dragon High Lord, Lord of all Tiamat's minions, or just kill all my opponents. Today I'm going to be playing Prosper Tomebound. This deck loves playing cards from Exile, because whenever I do that, Prosper is going to give me treasure, which I can save up to eventually cast a bunch of heavy-hitting, game-ending spells. And my commander is Galea, Kindler of Hope. This is a Voltron deck with a twist. I need to manipulate the top of my library so I can take advantage of Galea's ability and then stack a bunch of auras and equipment all onto one creature to make it really, really big and scary, and then use it to, you guessed it, knock out my opponents. And what I'm playing today is Sephiroth of the Hidden Ways. Some places you cannot go in life. This deck is all about venturing into the dungeon. 
and every time you move into a new room, you get a different effect. So my goal is to put creature cards into my graveyard, get through those dungeons as fast as possible, and reap the rewards at the end. And also somewhere in there, I'll try to win the game. Okay, let's play. All right, let's battle. Let's party. Let's fight. Welcome to the table, everybody. As always, let's reveal our awesome playmats. Ooh. Okay, well, we have two new players on the show. Everyone knows what that means, as is tradition. Joe, I knight thee. Sir Joe, arise. Yes. <laughs> That was that was the power of Tiamat washing over me. Oh, yes. that was the first time ever. Oh. Becca, I dub thee, Sir Becca, arise. Hurrah! Whoa! Was it good? Yeah, that was great. Yeah. Okay, great. Rage. <laughs> well, welcome to game nights. Only one may stand. Are you ready? Let's do I this. Guess so. Draw for turn, Mountain, and I will cast Dragon Master Outcast. Oh. <laughs> Scary in like five turns. It's interesting, you don't usually see this card played this early in the game because that's just a long time before Joe's gonna have six lands and a lot of opportunity for removal. I'm not really necessarily expecting to make any dragons with it. I just wanna start pecking at my opponents to make them angry. Pass to Jimmy. Thank you, Joe. I will draw my card for turn. I will play a planes and then I'm gonna cast Wayfarer's Bobble. Oh, reprint. Nice Lauren. reprint. Yeah. It's really exciting to see this card get reprinted in these pre-con decks. It's a perfect ramp card, especially if you don't have green. I'm playing Esper, so this is one of the best turn one players I can have. Pass turn to you, Becca. I will draw for turn. Play Mountain. Boom. Pass turn. All right, I will draw for turn. I'm gonna play a Forest. Yep. And then I'm going to play Abundant Growth, targeting my Forest. Nice. So from now on, it will tap for a man of any color, not just a green. And when that enters the battlefield, I will draw a card. Oh, okay. All right, that's it. Go ahead, Joe. Untap, draw for turn. I will play Crucible of the Spirit Dragon. Okay. Then I'm going to attack you, Josh, with my human shaman. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I have no blockers, so I'll take one and go to 39. Ugh. Okay, let's go. Pass you, Jimmy. Nice, I like that. All right, I will untap and draw for turn. Okay, I am going to play Choked Estuary. Noise. And I will reveal a Prairie Stream from my hand so it comes into play untapped. Okay. Pass turn, Becca. Draw for turn. We're gonna play a Swamp, and I'm gonna cast Rakdos Signet. Ramp, 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 ramp. Yes, nice. a ramp. What? I got ramp already. You nervous? You nervous? I'm coming out with my commander soon. Watch out. A uh, pass turn. All right, I will untap. I uh, will draw. Okay, I will play a Path of Ancestry, which comes into play tapped, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna tap one, and I'm gonna play an Explorer Scope. So this is normally not a great card, but it works pretty well with my commander. Galea allows me to look at the top card of my library, so I'll know if there's a land there so I can take full advantage of this effect. In the future, when I have a creature that is attached to and is attacking. So it's not really doing anything right now. Yeah, that's all I can do. I'll pass the turn. Okay, untap, and I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna play a mountain. Okay. And then I'm gonna tap three and I'm going to play the commander sphere. How much does your commander cost? Oh, it's your commander next turn, yeah. That's five, yeah. These commander decks are pre-cons, so they take a little bit longer to develop. The early rounds are very much like lightweight boxing where everyone's just feeling each other around. And then I'm gonna try to alienate all of the hosts of the show <laughs> and I'm going to attack Jimmy with my Dragon Master Outcast. Uh, it hurts, but only for one. So I'll go to 39. Merely a flesh wound. <laughs> okay, cool. At the end of the turn, I will crack my Wayfarer's Bowel, finding a swamp, and putting it onto battlefield tapped. Now, untap and draw for turn. I will play a Prairie Stream. I'm going to tap for three and cast my commander, oh. Zephyrus of the Hidden Ways. Death's door can be unlocked. My commander enables the main strategy of my entire deck, but it doesn't actually do anything on its own. I need to get creatures into the graveyard in order to venture into the dungeon. But once I do, the value train is gonna leave the station. Choo-choo. Pass turn to you, Becca. Untap, draw for turn. I will play Foreboding Ruins. As it enters the battlefield, I gotta show you this cute little swamp. Ah, so it comes in untapped. I'm gonna tap four and play Prosper, Tomebound. Wow. 
good. Nice. And now my commander is on the battlefield, and I am so excited about Prosper, because first, it's almost like it's giving me an extra card in hand each turn, and giving me mana to cast more stuff with treasure tokens. It's gonna be dope. Go to my end step, and my commander's gonna trigger, and I'm going to exile terminate. Whoa, that's pretty good. And I can play that until the end of my next turn. Mm. So yes, Becca's commander gives her card advantage, but there is a downside to it, right? The whole table gets to see what those cards are. So now I know she's got a removal spell. My deck is pretty susceptible to removal spells. So it's good to know about it. I can plan accordingly. Okay, I will untap. I will draw. I'm going to tap two, and I'm going to play Sram, Senior Edificer. Uh-oh. Whenever I play an equipment or aura or a vehicle, I can draw a card. Josh's commander lets him play cards off the top of his library. So together with SRAM, you can see the combo. He plays it off the top of the library, it automatically equips and bam, draws another card and keeps that going. I think this is probably one of the best cards in my deck. I'm a little hesitant to put it out there knowing about Becca's removal spell. However, I think Dragon Master Outcast and both the commanders from my opponents are probably juicier targets. So I'm just hoping Becca has her eyes on those and not this. And then, I guess I can't do anything else, so I'll pass the turn. Thank you. I will untap, draw for turn. Gonna play a forest. Well, we're getting pretty close to that Dragon Master. Yeah. Okay, so I'm starting to get nervous now. I will tap my Commander Sphere, and then I'll tap the rest of my lands to enter Vrondis, the Rage of Ancients. As a D&D &D player, I love the fact that dice rolling has now been integrated into magic. And of course, my draconic commander benefits greatly from it. If I can find things in my deck that allow me to roll dice, I'm gonna have an army of 5-4 dragons very soon. An interesting thing about Vrondis is that it creates these 5-4 tokens, which are huge, that's really big, but they have to be sacrificed when they deal damage. And it's kind of hard for me to gauge right now how big of a downside that is. We're just gonna have to see how it pans out. I'm gonna, scared. I'm gonna pass to Jimmy. Okay, I'm going to untap and draw my card for the turn. I will play an Esper Panorama, and then I will tap two mana and cast Arcane Signet. And then I will tap three mana and cast Hama Pashar, Ruin Seeker. I think we've been here before. Yikes. I was kind of skeptical about the new dungeon mechanics in Jimmy's deck until he pulled Hama Pashar, which means that he now doubles everything he finds inside one of these dungeons. This is definitely one of the best cards in my deck. Because the dungeons have so many different rooms and so many different things that happen, they're not actually all that powerful. So being able to double up on those abilities means that I'm generating extra value, I'm gonna get my engine going even faster, and hopefully create so much card advantage that my opponents can't stop me. And then then I can't really, actually I can, Josh is swinging you for two. Is that a two, three? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's bogus, okay, yeah. I will take two. Commander damage. That's right. I go to 37. <laughs> that's gonna do it for me, Becca, go for it. Okay, I untap, draw for turn. I'm gonna drop a swamp. Mm -hmm. Five mana to play with. Two of it may be terminating. If I don't use terminate during this turn, it's gonna go away forever, so. Okay, I have to decide what to kill and I am really worried about Joe's dragons. One target is gonna make flying dragons and one target is gonna make dragons on the ground. I guess we'll go for the flying dragon maker? Okay, I will play Terminate on Dragon Master Outcast. <laughs> and because I cast a card from Exile, my commander will trigger and I will make a treasure. Not happy about the termination of my Dragon Master Outcast. I thought it was gonna start paying off. Okay, this is exactly what I was hoping for. Joe's land count's getting higher, and 5-5 five, five dragons every turn are scary. So I'm glad Becca used her removal spell against that and not my stuff. Thank you, Becca. I'm gonna move to combat. I'll swing at Jimmy with Prosper, my commander. Okay, uh, that has death touch, so I ain't gonna block it. I'll take one damage going to 38. All right, and I will tap for Boating Ruins to tap my Rakdos Signet, and I will play Mindstone. Okay. Now I will move to my end step, and my commander will trigger, so I get to exile a Tally Primal Sword. Oh. But don't worry, he's in exile over here, just chilling. 
Okay, so Prosper is amazing. I get this extra card each turn, but now I have exiled this super powerful card and I have all the mana to cast it. I just wish that my opponents didn't know it was coming. Let's see what they can do about it. That thing is terrifying. If that swings once at this table, it's gonna completely throw things in her favor. We can't let that happen. Here's hoping someone has an answer for it. All right, I'm going to untap. I will drop. Okay, I'm gonna pay one and I'm gonna attach my Explorer Scope to SRAM. All right, and then I'll go to combat and I will attack you, Becca, for two. On that attack, the Explorer Scope will trigger, so I will look at the top card of my library. If it's a land card, I get to put it, it doesn't matter, it's not a land card. That sucks. It's a telescope, I mean, what do you want? All right, and then we'll go to damage. Hey, blocks. hold up, just before you do that, I'm going to Chaos Warp SRAM. <laughs> Ugh. Okay, well, losing SRAM's not great because I, my card draw engine, and you know I love those. However, it's a Chaos Warp. It is possible I flip something better off the top of my deck, so let's see what I get here. Come on, instant sorcery, maybe a land. And then I'll reveal the top card, and if it's a permanent, it comes into play. Come on, something. <laughs> ah! <laughs> it is a Brainstorm, which is not a permanent. It just stays on top of my library. That wasn't great, yeah. <laughs> so this went pretty badly. My SRAM, my Cardra engine gets shuffled into my library, who the heck knows where it is, and I don't even get anything in exchange for it. Couldn't have gone worse. Well, I guess my land for turn will be a Simic Growth Chamber, and that will return my Thriving Grove to my hand. And then I'm gonna tap two, and I'm gonna play Fleece Mane Lion. Mm. So my deck's kind of a Voltron deck. It wants to put a bunch of auras and equipment onto something and make one creature really, really big. The downside of that, if somebody destroys that thing, you put a lot of resources into it and it can really hurt you. So you want cards like Fleece Main Lion because it can become indestructible, which makes it harder to destroy and safer to put your stuff on. That turn didn't go very good. I'm sorry. Here you go. Okay, I will untap and I will draw my card for the turn, play a mountain, and then I will tap four. Okay. And this will count as green, and I will enter onto the battlefield my Dragonborn Champion. Oh, sick. <laughs> now out comes my Dragonborn Champion to join my commander, which is perfect because anytime a 5-4 dragon spawn by my commander cause damage, I'm gonna be able to draw cards. I'm feeling scary at this point. And then I'm gonna tap Forest and Crucible and play Rampant Growth. Nice. Which lets me search my library for a uh, forest. Okay. It goes into play tapped. And then I will... Definitely swing and kill I'm gonna swing. No, don't do that. She well, she's the only one that I haven't hit yet. I've already hit the and other she two. she killed your thing. He convinced me. <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm going to attack you with Verandas. It blocks. Uh, I go to 35. Uh. That is commander damage. And because of my Dragonborn Champion's ability, I draw a card. Nice, that's good value. Dragons. All right, well that was a pretty good turn. Yeah. Okay, and I will pass to Jimmy. All right, I will untap and draw for turn. Oh, <laughs> hello there. I will tap my Esper Panorama and play a Soul Ring. Woo, been a while. Ooh. Then I'll play Hostage Taker. It's yours is no mine. Oh. Becca, I'm gonna target your commander. No. I would much rather exile something I can play later, but Becca's commander just is generating so much value. Being able to slow her down a little bit, I think is the most important thing for the rest of the table to be able to keep up. So I'm gonna take one for the team here and get rid of it. He's going to the command zone. <laughs> Rude, Jimmy. You trying to make enemies here? I get it. I got Atali Primal Storm waiting to be cast and they're worried. It's fair. Okay, well, let's remember this happened. Maybe you could deal with the dragons next time. Eh. All right, I'm gonna go to combat. <laughs> and, uh... No! Becca! What? I mean, may as well. I'll swing at you for four damage. All right. I'll go to 31. That's gonna do it for me. I'll pass turn to you. Don't hate me. Untap and hate Jimmy for turn. <laughs> <laughs> hate Jimmy for turn. That's only for turn. It's not that bad, okay, actually. Not bad. Yeah. yeah, I'm down, I'm down. I'm gonna play Zalfarin Void which allows me to scry. Mm, I think I'm gonna put that on bottom. Okay. I'm just gonna play my face up card here. I will cast Atali Primal Storm. 
Okay, a tally is on the battlefield. I just need it to live for at least one round so I can get one trigger off of it. So please, nobody kill my dinosaur. This card is really, really powerful, very, very scary. The advantage it causes can be huge. So I'm really hoping that either Joe or Jimmy has a removal spell, because I don't. Pass turn. A tally is terrifying. All right, I will untap. I will draw what everyone knows to be a brainstorm into my hand. All right, I'm gonna pay four and cast my commander, Galea, Kindler of Hope. Wow. So my commander's pretty interesting. It does provide some card advantage because anything you cast off the top of your deck, it's almost like you drew it. However, it can be hit and miss. So for this to be really good, I'm gonna have to kind of get lucky with what's on top of my library. And since I use Path of Ancestry to cast it, I get to scry one. That is not an aura or equipment. I'm gonna put that on the bottom. And then because of my commander's ability, I can look at the top card of my library. I don't know what that card is, but it's not an equipment. And then I will pass the turn, Joe, go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna untap, draw for turn, and I will play Mountain for land. Yep. My Mountain Peak is growing. I am going to summon my Earth Cult Elemental. <gasps> Whoa. Okay, Joe's gonna roll the dice here, which is very cool. That's what his commander wants. I definitely don't want a 20. I don't wanna have to sack two things. So I'm really hoping for a 10 or above so that I don't have to sacrifice anything off of my battlefield. No one in the dragon army is expendable. So I roll a d20. It's everybody if it's below 10. It's just us, not you, Joe, if it's 10 to 19. Two of you roll a 20. All right, let's see that d20. Oh gosh. Okay, I rolled a six. So one through nine, each player sacrifices a permanent, each player, including me. Okay. Unfortunately, I will sacrifice my mountain, which means my mountain range gets one mountain smaller. <laughs> I'm gonna sacrifice my Esper Panorama. I will sack my Zelfrin Void. And I'm gonna sack my Abundant Growth. Oh, nice, yeah. Mm. I already drew my card off it. So this actually ends up pretty good for me. All of my opponents sacrifice a land, and I just sacrifice an enchantment that I already drew a card for when it came into play. So I don't really lose anything, and they're all set behind. So this elemental actually helped me out. Now, because I rolled a die, oh. Vrondis then activates, dealing one point of damage to himself, which then triggers a 5-4 Dragon Spirit. Wow. When it deals damage, I sacrifice it. Okay. So Joe gets to roll a die. That means his commander makes a 5-4 dragon. Now it's not flying, and it does have to sacrifice itself when it deals damage, but I'm scared. So then I'm going to go to combat. Okay, Joe, I have something to offer you. Yvronis likes to have damage dealt to it, and you want to deal damage to draw cards, right? If you swing at me with both of those, I will block your Vrondus with my hostage taker. It's only gonna do two damage to it, so your Vrondus stays alive because it only has one damage marked on it. You're gonna get through for five and draw a card, and you're gonna make a spirit token. All I ask is that on the next turn you have, you just don't, you leave me alone. Don't attack me, don't get rid of my stuff. This sounds like a terrible deal for the whole table. Jimmy, you're helping Joe to draw cards when he's already getting way ahead. What are you doing? I don't understand what the deal even is here. Joe can just attack Jimmy anyway and not make any deal. Jimmy's saying, attack me. Joe could just be like, yeah, I'm going to. And also, I don't have to owe you anything for that. This whole thing makes no sense. There's a part of me that's skeptical about Jimmy's deal, but when I really think about what I'm gonna get out of it and a temporary alliance so that I can focus on the other side of the table, I decide to take it because I get an extra dragon out of it. Yeah. Let's go, let's do it. All right, Jimmy, I am attacking you with my dragon army. Oh, come on. All right, I'm gonna block your commander with my hostage taker. And then I'll take five damage from the unblocked creature going to 33. Because he takes the damage, he starts raging again, which yeah. creates another 5-4 landlocked dragon spirit. Look at all that value. And because you took five damage, my champion will trigger. I draw a card. Very nice. And then when my hostage taker dies, that's gonna trigger my commander, and I'm going to venture into the dungeon. <gasps> Ooh, which one? I'm going into the dungeon of the Mad Mage. Ooh. So when you venture into a dungeon, you can choose any of the three dungeons that exist to go into. And Jimmy chooses Dungeon of the Mad Mage. So the way this works is he's gonna land in the first room of the dungeon. And from here, whenever he ventures again, he'll go to the next room. All along the way, he's gonna keep getting these little effects, these little bonuses. 
But each of the effects in the rooms seems kind of small. I'm not sure if it's gonna matter that much. So I'm less worried about the dungeons in this game, more worried about the dragons. So when I venture into the dungeon, it starts off with the yawning portal, which says you gain one life. So I go to 34. And because I have Hama Pashar out, the room abilities of dungeons trigger an additional time, so I'm gonna gain another life and go to 35. Sweet, bro. Two life, not a huge deal, but just wait. Because when we get deeper into this dungeon, some crazy things might start happening. And with that, I will pass my turn. Untap and draw my card for turn. I am going to pay five mana and cast Cloud Blazer. Nice. When it enters the battlefield, I gain two life and draw two cards. So I'll go to 37. Cloud Blazer's pretty good. And then I'm going to tap three lands and play Dungeon Map. Pretty sweet. This card is sneaky good in my deck. I want to find as many ways to get through the dungeon as fast as possible. The mana cost on it is a little steep, but at least it serves as a mana rock on other turns. That's gonna do it for me. I will pass the turn to you, Becca. All right, let me untap. Draw. So the bad news here is that Becca's untapping and nobody was able to deal with that Atali. It really just depends what's on top of everyone's library. If they're all lands, it won't be a big deal. But if they're like seven and eight drops, even just one or two, it could swing the game hugely in Becca's favor right now. So we just gotta cross our fingers and hope that it's not too bad. Before I attack with Atali, the first thing I'm gonna do is recast my commander. This is good sequencing, this is good sequencing. Because when a Tali Primal Storm attacks, I get to exile the top card of everybody's library, and if I cast from exile, then Prospero will trigger. So that sounds pretty sweet. You could get at least four triggers here, possibly. All right, well, who are you gonna attack is the question here. Joe, you're looking the scariest to me right now, so I'm gonna swing at you with a Tali Primal Storm. That is bad. Yeah, there's no good attack, but of course I'm gonna swing with the Tali. I need to get some value before somebody comes up with a removal spell. So we're swinging. And when it attacks, it's going to trigger. Oh crap, this is gonna be so bad if it flips some scary stuff. Fingers crossed that we all just have lands on the top of our deck. That would be the best case scenario. Maybe a couple of creatures, small ones though, nothing crazy. So everyone, please reveal the top card of your library. Yeah! I reveal wing boots. I reveal skyline despot. I reveal plague crafter. And I reveal death tyrant. Oh, this is so bad. Ugh, so glad I don't have to pay their mana costs. Oh, so glad. What? Four cards off of this Atali trigger? For me? Okay. So I'm gonna cast all four of these. The skyline despot will trigger and I will become the monarch. Oh man. Becca stole my dragon, not cool. You don't steal dragons from the dragon army. And then, Plague Crafter. When it ETPs, everybody has to sack a creature and I will sacrifice Plague Crafter to his own effect. Uh, I guess I'm gonna sacrifice my Fleece Mane Lion. I'm going to sacrifice a Dragon Spirit. I'm gonna sacrifice Cloud Blazer. And because I had to sack a creature, Sephiris is going to trigger. So I'm gonna move and venture into the dungeon one more time to the next room, dungeon level. So I'm going to scry one, but I actually get to scry one twice because of Hama Pashar. Scry one and then scry one again? Yep. Uh, nope, don't want that. I'll put that on the bottom. Not bad. And then I will scry one again. Okay. Hmm, interesting. And I'll keep that on top. Wow, this is brutal. Becca just got such a massive advantage off of all of these cards and they all impact the board and they're gonna affect us too. This could not have gone any better. In addition to everybody having to sack something off the Plague Crafter, I become the Monarch. This is pretty sweet. And that was four cards I cast from Exile. So my commander will trigger and I'll create four treasure tokens. <laughs> Value. Hey Joe, we're still in combat. You gonna block my Atali? Yes, I believe I will with my Earth Cult Elemental. That's a shame, they both die. Joe, thanks for taking one for the table. So Atali had to trade with the Elemental, but I got a lot of value out of that play. Not mad about it. When your Elemental died, that was a blocking creature. So that's going to trigger my Death Tyrant and I'll create two Black Zombie Creature Tokens. <laughs> Yowza. I'm not gonna play anything from my hand, but I am going to equip Prosper with winged boots. I am going to move to my instep. So I'll draw for Monarch, and I will exile the top card of my library because of my commander, and I can play that till the end of my next turn. All right. I mean, honestly, this goes about as bad as it could go. I mean, look at what just happened. 
She had a creature come in, made us all sack a creature, got value off that. Had another creature come in, she becomes the monarch. She's gonna get value off that. Newsflash, Atali's good. Eva approaches. Go for the eyes, boo! Oh, I see. You are lucky. I, Minsk beloved ranger, mistook you for a villain, but Boo's keen hamster senses have saved you. You know, a hero must be careful about how they appear. I, for instance, shave my head to intimidate enemies, while Boo is covered in hair, also to intimidate enemies. Sadly, 50,000 men are robbed of any choice by the dastardly male pattern baldness. Lucky for them, there is Keeps, the simple stress-free way to keep your hair. With Keeps, you need not even leave your home. Simply meet with a doctor online and have your medication sent right to your door in discreet packaging. Treatments start at a mere $10 a month and results are proven. But there is no time to waste. Keeps can take four to six months to take effect, and evil isn't going to wait idle in the meantime. So make way, hair loss. I'm armed with keeps and packing a hamster. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash nights to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash nights. That's nights with a K to get your first month free. Again, keeps.com slash nights. Pass turn to you, Josh. All right, I will untap. I will draw. Because of my commander, I will look at the top card in my library. Okay, I'm gonna tap this Thriving Grove for a blue, and I'm gonna brainstorm. Oof. So I'll draw three cards. Because of Galea, Josh really wants to organize the cards on the top of his library. Brainstorm's a great way to guarantee that he has auras and equipments on top of there. And then I will put two cards on top of my library. And then I'm gonna look at the top card of my library because of Galea, and I'm gonna cast it because it's an equipment, which is Moon Silver Spear. Mm. Uh oh. And because of my commander's ability, I can actually attach it without paying its equip cost. So I'm gonna equip it to Galea. So it's now a 4 4 Vigilance First Strike. And when it attacks, I make a 4 4 Angel. Jeez, okay. Uh, and then I'm gonna pay one and equip my Explorer Scope to Galea. Cool. And then I will go to combat, and Jimmy, you're the only good attack I have, so I'm going to swing my commander at you. Whoa. Before blocks, there's two triggers, Explore Scope and Moon Silver Spear. So I'll make a 4-4 Angel token. And then I have the Explorer Scope trigger. So I'll look at the top card of my library. It is a land, so it will come into play tapped. Aye, aye, aye. Good old Brainstorm. So with the Brainstorm, I'm able to put an equipment on the top, equip it for free, and then make sure I have a land there. I just wish I had like, you know, five or six more Brainstorms in my deck, said every legacy and historic player ever. All right, Jimmy, and then we will go to blocks. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna block, so I'll just take four damage and go to 33. Um, and then that's all I can do. I will pass the turn. Okay, on your end step, I will tap my mountain to activate my Crucible of the Spirit Dragon to add a counter. Okay, dragon and up. Dragony stuff. He's the Dragonator. Okay, I am the Dragonator. Oh. <laughs> this is fantastic. Uh, uh, then I will uh, I'll untap my lands. <laughs> So all of a sudden I become the Dragonator and then the beautiful thing is right now I'm developing so much land that there's the Bavarian mountains that roll down and meet the beautiful forests and woodlands of California. Okay. I'm going to cast Dragon's Horde. Oh. And I will also cast Colossal Majesty. Oh, that's pretty good. This is a really good value engine for Joe's deck. Frondus makes five four dragon tokens. That means it's going to put counters on the Dragon's Horde as well as trigger his Colossal Majesty. So no matter what, Joe's going to have access to draw more cards into his hand. And if this game is going long, these are amazing cards for him. I will attack you, Josh, with my Dragon Spirit. I don't want to trade my angel for that, so yeah, I'm just going to take five. Going to 32. Nice. And when my dragon spirit deals damage, I sacrifice it. Oh, thank goodness. But also, because my of my dragonborn champion, when a source I control deals five or more damage to a player, I draw a card. Those five, four dragon spirits, the fact that you have to sacrifice them doesn't wind up being a big deal because they're doing so much damage, and then there's so many other things that work synergistically within your deck. You come out a winner every time. And with that, I will pass my turn. I will untap, and I'll draw my card for the turn. Uh, I'm going to tap six mana and cast Sun Titan. Sun Titan! Uh -oh. oh, jeez. When it enters the battlefield, I will target Playcrafter. Playcrafter, sweet. Love that choice. 
That's the worst. <laughs> play crafter is going to enter the battlefield. When they enter the battlefield, every player sacrifices a creature or a planeswalker. Okay, wow. And here I get caught because I've got two great draconic cards on the board. One is my commander, the other is my dragonborn champion, and I have to sack one of them. I will sacrifice my play crafter. I got a zombie token that I don't care if it dies. I will sacrifice my angel. I will sacrifice my dragonborn champion. And when that creature dies, that's gonna trigger my commander. And then I'm going to enter into the next room of the dungeon. Oh, but there's a fork in the road here. So I can enter the Twisted Caverns and choose two creatures to not be able to attack next turn. Oh, wow. You're not gonna swing it with your giant dragon, are you? Otherwise, I'm just gonna stop it from being able to attack. In that case, I will not swing at you with my giant dragon. Okay, great. So I'm gonna venture into the Goblin Bazaar. And it triggers twice because of Hama Pashar, so I'm gonna create two treasure tokens. <laughs> Not bad. I was a little jealous of you over there. And that's gonna be it for me. I'll pass the turn to you, Becca. All right, I will untap. During my upkeep, oh. I'm still the monarch, oh therefore I create a 5-5 dragon creature token with flying. Oh, I totally forgot she was just gonna get free 5-5s. Five I missed that card. Okay, it got to my upkeep and I get to make this 5-5 five five flying dragon off of Joe's card. This is awesome. If people can't get to me to take my monarch, this could be my game. I will cast Felwar Stone. Burn two treasure to play it, but then I get one back because I'm casting it from exile. Oh, that's interesting. She's Louise. And then I will cast Pontiff of Blight. What? Mm. If those crazy dragons weren't enough, now she has extort on every single one of her creatures. Now all she has to do is just pay the extra mana and just suck all of our life away. This is such a bad situation for the entire table. So, other creatures you control have extort. So anytime you cast Anytime you cast, you can pay up to one, two, three, four, five mana. And, and drain us all for five. Jeez. So this is problematic because it gives Becca a way to victory that doesn't involve attacking. So now what she can do is just sit back, hold the monarch, get a dragon every turn, and slowly extort us out over the course of the next three or four turns. It's a pretty good setup, and I'm starting to get pretty worried. She's definitely in command of this game. Uh, I feel like it just makes sense to extort before anybody can do anything about it, right? Wrong. So, we'll just pay two to cast Dire Fleet Daredevil. When I cast Dire Fleet Daredevil, I'm going to extort twice and sack two treasure tokens. Okay, so we each take two and you gain six. I go to 30. I go to 38. I go to 31. How did it feel to take damage for the first time, Joe? If it bleeds, we can kill it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I gain six and I go to 37. So what uh, are you targeting with the daredevil? I am targeting the brainstorm in your graveyard, Josh. Okay, so this is cool sequencing from Becca here with the brainstorm. She's kind of able to do what I was able to do set the top of her library and then take advantage of it because it does matter what she exiles face up with her commander. She can kind of pick and choose now. And because that's casting a spell from exile, I will create a treasure token. All right, uh, and then I'm gonna move to combat. And so I'm gonna swing at you, Josh, uh, with my Skyline Despot and Death Ooh. Tyrant for a total of nine. Both of them? <laughs> okay, uh, well, one has medicine, one's flying, so I can't block either of them. I guess I will take nine. And I'll go to 21. That hurt a little bit. And now I'm gonna move to my end step. I'm going to flip a card and exile it with Prosper. That's a land. And now I will draw a card because I am the monarch. Dang. Okay, my turn? Pass turn. I'm going to untap and I will draw. I'm gonna look at my top card because of my commander. Is it the big winner? It's not great. All right, I'm gonna pay two and I'll play Sword of the Animist. All right, pretty sweet. Then I'm going to immediately equip it to my commander. So it's now a 5-5. Five, five. Then I'm going to cast Nature's Lore. And I'll search my library and I'll find a forest and put that into play. One of the best ways to win any game of Commander is just to have more mana available than your opponents. What I'm really focused on this turn is getting a land on top of my library so I can get it into play for free off my Explorers to go. And so I'm using my shuffle effects to try and get as many chances at having a land there as possible. All right, and then since I've shuffled, I will look at the top card of my library because of my commander. Damn it, it's not an equipment or a land. Uh, and then I'm gonna go to combat, and I'm sorry, Joe, but you're the only one I can attack, so I'm gonna swing at you for five. Filthy. Before blocks, there's a bunch of triggers. I'm gonna make a 4-4 four, four angel. And then Sword of the Animus is gonna trigger. 
So I'll search my library and I will find a planes and put that onto the battlefield tapped. Not bad at all. And then explorer scope will trigger and I will look at the top card of my library and it is a land, so I'll put it onto the battlefield tapped. Sorry, Joe, it's still attacking you for five. That I will drop to 33. And that's commander damage. But it's only five. Yeah, that's all I can do, so I will pass the turn. So this was a really good turn for me. I am able to get three extra lands into play, and I'm gonna need all that mana if I wanna be able to catch up to all my opponents. End step, I'm gonna tap a mountain to reactivate my Crucible of the Spirit Dragon. So it has two counters on it now? Correct. All right, I will untap. At the beginning of my upkeep, I do control a creature with power four or greater. My Colossal Majesty allows me to draw. Now I will draw for turn. And then I'm gonna play Return of the Wild Speaker. Wow. Okay, not bad. So are you gonna draw cards or pump your stuff? Pump. I'm gonna draw cards. Uh, I like that decision. Draw five mana, draw five is sick. Uh-oh, not good. I went into the turn afraid for my life, so I need more cards, I need more choices. A lot, a lot more options now. I am very scared of Joe. If anybody can dethrone me, it's him. He's got a lot of things that he's thinking about over there. He's making me nervous. So I draw the cards off of Return of the Wild Speaker and I get exactly what I'm looking for. So it's gonna be bloody. It's gonna be bloody. I like that. Uh oh. But I'm gonna cast Chain Reaction. <gasps> what? Wow. How many creatures are on the board? I have six. I have three. So that's nine, 10, 11, 12. Wow. 12 creatures. Everything takes 12 damage. Wow, dodged a bullet. Becca was way ahead in this game, and I don't know how we're gonna overcome it. So resetting the board, I'm okay with it. Okay, does anybody have any effects? Yes, I'm gonna tap four mana, sacrificing one treasure, and I'm going to cast Vanish into Memory. I am going to just target your 5-5 five, five dragon with this, Becca. Oh, interesting. By targeting Becca's token with this spell, I get to draw the cards, but because it's a token, it never can come back to the battlefield. So that means I don't need to discard anything. So this just becomes a four mana draw five at instant speed. Not bad. And then the chain reaction resolves? Yes. All right, all the creatures die. Because a creature hit my graveyard, my commander will trigger, and I'm going to move to the next layer of the dungeon. The lost level, and I get to scry too. But Hama Pushar is not on the battlefield when that happens, so I'm just gonna do it once. Uh, I will keep this card on top and put the other card on the bottom. Sure, yeah, okay. And then, because of the chain reaction, Rondis takes damage, which then triggers a 5-4 Dragon Spirit. Nice. Oh, and when my Dragon Spirit enters the board, it triggers my Dragon's Horde, which means that I get a gold counter. And with that, I will pass the Jimmy. Okie dokie. I will untap and I'll draw for turn. Um, I'm going to tap for five and bring my commander back out. Mm. Sephiris of the Hidden Ways. Nothing is forever. Makes sense. Okay, uh, and then I am going to tap three and I'm gonna activate my dungeon map to venture into the dungeon once again. And I'll go to the Runestone Caverns. And I get to exile the top two cards of my library and I can play them. Oh, that's cool. I'm gonna flip over a Thriving Isle and a Component Pouch. Mm. Sure. I don't wanna play either of those, so they'll just stay exiled. I'm just kind of sad that Hama Pashar is now because that way I would have gotten four cards. But still, it gets me even closer to completing that dungeon. And with that, I will pass turn to you, Becca. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. I will untap, uh, upkeep, and draw for turn. I think the first thing I need to do is cast Prosper Tomebound, which now costs eight whole mana. Jeez. And then I'm gonna play this mountain from exile, which will create a treasure token. All right. My commander says it's whenever I play a card from exile. So that includes lands, which means I still get the treasure. Let's just tap this mountain to equip Prosper with wing boots. Oh, flying. And then on my instep, I have both the trigger off the monarch and Prosper. Let's exile first the swamp, and then I will draw for the monarch. Nice. And I'm going to discard a mountain because I have eight cards in hand. All done? I will pass turn. All right, I will untap. I will draw. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm going to do nothing this turn. I'm just going to pass Joe. Go ahead. Oh, oh, that's not good. So Josh just passes the turn. That's kind of suspicious, right? What is going on over there? I I'm starting to think, do I need to play my turn differently? Because if he's holding up some instant speed interaction, I don't want to be the target of it. Uh, I will untap. Okay. And at the beginning of my upkeep, my Colossal Majesty triggers, so I draw a card. Nice. And I will draw my card for the turn. 
And uh, I'm gonna take my counter off of my dragon's horde and I will draw. Pretty good. Card advantage, card advantage, card advantage. We know how important it is. I think it's a huge factor in who wins games of Commander. And I feel like I'm really at the bottom. Everybody else has had access to more cards than me this game. It doesn't feel good. And then, Rondus enters <laughs> again. And Vrondus is a dragon. I get a gold counter on my dragon sword. Nice. And then I will cast my Neverwinter Hydra. So X is equal to one. Interesting. Okay, so you're gonna roll, oh, this allows you to roll a dice, got it. Well, this is the thing, with the Hydra, I get to roll a die which activates Vrondus, which means I'm going to get a 5-4 no matter what, and I might wind up with a 6-6 trample creature. Okay, so it's gonna become whatever this number is. Yep, yep, yep. Two. Two, all right, so it's a two-two. And because a die was rolled, Vrondus takes one point of damage, starts raging, and therefore creates another 5-4 dragon spirit that has wow. summoning sickness. And because a dragon enters the board, my golden counter goes up to two. Pretty good value, Not yeah. Bad. That's a value. Not bad. And I attack Becca with Dragon Spirit. I will not block, I take five. I go to 32. Okay, he sacrifices because he dealt damage. And now I am the captain. I'm the captain. Okay, Look at me. Mr. I am the monarch. <laughs> <laughs> On my end step, uh, because I am now the monarch, we're gonna call it Dragon High Lord. <laughs> the, right, the rightful heir. I am now the Dragon High Lord. Uh, I get to draw a card. Nice. You wear it well. Mm -hmm. On your end step, I'm gonna tap my Nimbus Maze for blue and I'm going to cycle the Curator of Mysteries. That's cool. Severus doesn't actually care if my creatures die. It just wants to put creatures into the graveyard from anywhere. So cycling counts as well. I'm into the deep mines now and I get to scry three cards. Oh, you get to do that before you draw the card, nice. Yes, and I'm gonna put all three of these cards on the bottom of my library. Oh. And then I will draw for the cycling cost. All right. And now I am one step away. So the next time I venture into this dungeon, I'm gonna complete it and trigger my commander. I can't wait. I'll go to my discard phase because I have nine cards. I will discard two. All right, and now I will untap, go to my upkeep, and draw my card for turn. All right, the first thing I'm gonna do, very exciting, I'm gonna tap three mana and my dungeon map to venture once more into the dungeon and complete the dungeon of the Mad Mage. Yay. It's the first dungeon completion. Whoa! Yes, I have fully completed the Dungeon of the Mad Mage in the span of one Commander game. I'm feeling pretty good about myself, but more importantly, look at what I get to do. So as I enter the Mad Wizard's Lair, I draw three cards and reveal them, and I may cast one of them without paying its mana cost. Oh. Insane. I'm just thinking whatever Jimmy gets, he kind of deserves it. I mean, he really worked to get through that dungeon. Okay, well, I wasn't really sure about the dungeon every step along the way. Seems like the rewards are kind of small, but for completing it, this one's legit. So we just kind of hope that there's nothing really, really big there. Because this could represent like a seven or eight mana spell. All right, so I will draw three cards off the top of my library and reveal them. I revealed a Victimize, a Terramorphic Expanse, and a Swamp. Dang it. Ouch. None of them are castable. Victimize is castable, but I don't want to do it. I'm starting to feel a little bit bad for Jimmy. This isn't going his way. This is not great. I was really hoping to draw some really high mana value cards and slam it on the table and just take over the game, but at least I still have my commander's trigger from completing that dungeon. Okay, well, I don't actually want to cast any of these right now, so I'm going to just put them into my hand. Mm. Because I completed a dungeon, that's going to trigger my commander, and I get to return a target creature card from my graveyard to the battlefield. Oh, oh that's pretty good. Sun so, Titan's in there. I'm going to go ahead and choose Sun Titan. Did someone say Sun Titan? Okay. Wait, I've seen this. Yeah. I've heard this song before. Mm -hmm. You have indeed. Oh boy. And when it comes back onto the battlefield, I can return target permanent card with mana three or less. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab Ama Pashar, the oh. Rune Seeker. And then I will tap four mana and cast a Solemn Simulacrum. That's pretty good. And I'll search my library. I'll get an island. Put that onto the battlefield tapped. Sure. Looking around the board, I'm feeling behind and one of the best ways I can catch up is just having more mana accessible to me. I'll tap two mana and sacrifice a treasure and cast Victimize. Oh no. And I'm gonna target Hostage Taker and Cloud Blazer. 
Oh, come on. This is a lot of value from Jimmy here. He's about to draw three cards, gain two life, and exile something off the battlefield that he can then probably recast. Even with whiffing on completing the dungeon, this is a pretty explosive turn from Jimmy here. This is gonna be so big for me and put me right back into this game. Hold up, before Victimize resolves, look, I maybe should have made this decision earlier in Jimmy's turn, but now I need things to stop over there. I would like to play Rakdos Charm. Oh. And I would like to select to exile all cards from target player's graveyard. I will target Jimmy, cause I'm mean. Oh man. <laughs> I have chosen to victimize you. Mean. That is so rough. <laughs> so what happens here is that she exiles my graveyard. That means I can't target those creatures. My spell completely fizzles. Those two cards will not come back to the battlefield. They will get exiled along with the rest of my graveyard. Yeah, Jimmy, he doesn't show a lot of emotion, but I could tell sitting next to him, he was in pain. Okay, because there are no longer any legal targets for victimized, the spell fizzles, so it's just gonna go to my graveyard. And the Solemn will not be sacrificed. It's like a lose-lose, because you want to sacrifice it, right? <laughs> yeah. To add insult to injury, Jimmy actually wanted the Solemn Simulacrum to die so he could venture again and draw the card, and now it's just sitting there alive. That was a pretty good play by Becca there. I'll go to my end step, and because I have eight cards in hand, I will discard a Terramorphic Expanse. And I'll pass the turn to you, Becca. This was a really disappointing turn. I completed the dungeon, but didn't flip anything crazy off the top of my library. I couldn't cast a really impactful spell, and now I'm just sort of sitting here twiddling my thumbs hoping that no one comes after me. I feel really bad about where I'm at now. I untap and draw for turn, and then I'm going to play my swamp from exile, and that will create a treasure token because of Prosper. All right. And then I will cast Vandal Blast. Overloaded. Oh, great. Yeah, that card, just great. Ugh. This hurts me a lot because I have my equipment still sitting there on the battlefield waiting for another creature to wield it and now it's all gone. I would love to say that I left all this mana open so I could stop that in some way, but uh, I can't stop it. So I have no effects. I have no effects. I'm going to sacrifice Commander Sphere to draw a card. Okay. Makes sense. All right, and then we lose all our artifacts. Goodbye, no. artifact. <laughs> I blew everything up. My Solemn's going to die, so that means I get to draw a card. And that's also gonna trigger my commander, so I'm gonna venture right back into the dungeon, and I'm going back for more, the dungeon of the Mad Mage. I gain one life, but that happens twice because of Hama Bashar, so I'm gonna go to 33 life. I'm gonna go right back into the same dungeon. I didn't have the best results the first time through, but I'm pretty sure if I replay this campaign, it'll be better this time around. And I will cast Ebony Fly. Oh, interesting. A little sneaky versatility engine here. I can have a fly, I can have mana, whatever I want. And then I will move to my instep and exile the top card of my library. And it's shiny impetus. All right, and I pass turn. Uh, on your end step, I'm gonna tap all my mana, Whoa. which is 10 mana total, and I'm gonna cast Diviner's Portent where X is equal to seven. Oh. Uh, and I'm gonna roll a D20. If it's 15 or more, I get to scry X, then draw X. Otherwise, I just draw X. Whoa. All right. So no we'll, whammies, no whammies. Let's roll. And stop. That is a six, so I will not scry. I will just draw seven. <laughs> Pretty good. I feel like I really haven't been able to do much so far, and I'm hoping this gives me enough options that I can at least have an impact on this game. All right, I got a lot of cards now. I will untap, draw for turn. Let us play a forest. All right, I'm gonna start off by tapping six, and I'm gonna replay my commander, Galea. Very cool. Nice. And then, because my commander's out, I'm gonna look at the top card of my library. It is not an equipment or aura. Uh, then I'm gonna tap two. I'm gonna play Sram, Senior Edificer. Oh, come on. Sram is back. All right, then I'm gonna tap two. I'm gonna play Swiftfoot Boots. That's gonna trigger Sram. So I'm gonna draw a card. Nice. Swiftfoot Boots is important for two reasons. Suiting a bunch of stuff on one thing, if you can make it hexproof, it's a lot safer. But also, if things happen to die, the haste is really important to get me back out there and swinging as fast as possible. I'm gonna look at the top card of my library because of my commander. It's not an equipment. And then I'm gonna tap for a green, and I'm gonna play Rancor on SRAM. That's gonna trigger SRAM, I will draw a card. Then I will look at the top card of my library. Ugh. And I will move to discard three cards. Feels kind of bad, because Josh hasn't done that much this game. All of his equipment just got blown up, and he spent his entire turn just rebuilding what he already had. 
I will untap. And at the beginning of my upkeep, because of Colossal Majesty, I will draw. Now I will draw for turn. And then I'm going to play my Dragon Speaker Shaman. Nice. I am extremely worried. Ever since that board wipe, Joe has just been going nuts over there. And now he can cast even more dragons, even more cheaply. This is going from bad to worse. So with that, I'm then going to cast Vengeful Ancestor. Ooh. So now, who do I want to go? Um, I will go Jimmy Sun Titan. Ooh, I like it. I'm down. So Joe goads my Sun Titan, which means it has to attack either Becca or Josh next turn. And I'm actually pretty okay with this. I was planning to swing with it anyway, as I do get a really nice attack trigger. So now I will cast Thunderbreak Regents. Wow, so all these two mana dragons. And then I'll cast the component pouch. Oh, nice. So now I play Thunderbreak Regent, which means I have two flying creatures. I am starting to assemble my flying dragon army. Becca, I'm swinging with dragon spirit. Okay, no blocks. I take five. I'm now at 27 life. All right. And he sacrifices. I'm going to go to end step, which means I draw a card. Because of the monarch? I'm the dragon high lord. <laughs> Dra sorry, dragon high lord. Dragon high lord. Yeah, sorry, dragon high lord. Yes. That's all I got. Pass to Jimmy. Nice. Your turn. Okay, uh, I'm going to untap and draw my card for turn. Um, I will play a swamp for turn, and then I'll go to combat. The sun titan is goaded, so I have to attack with it, and I can't attack Joe, so the sun titan is coming at you, Becca. Because of my vengeful ancestor, your sun titan actually does one point of damage to you. Ouch. I will go to 32 life. Sun Titan's gonna trigger, and I'm gonna bring the dungeon map back onto my battlefield. Nice. Okay, in response to that attack, I will play Hellish Rebuke. That's a classic D&D &D tiefling or warlock ability. I wish I could have targeted more of Jimmy's creatures with this, but I do want to get Sun Titan off the battlefield. Okay, go to damage. All right, I will not block and take six damage going to 21. But then Jimmy, because of the Hellish Rebuke, he'll have to sacrifice the Sun Titan and lose two life. Sounds good, I will go to 30 and the Sun Titan will die. Ah, oh, that's a bummer. I really wanted to have that Sun Titan out in the battlefield, but I did get my dungeon map back and that's one of the more important cards in my deck. So again, I'm just hoping that the value I get from going through these dungeons is gonna keep me alive in this game. Hey folks, it's me, Garrick. This is a very important summer for me. I don't want to get too deep into it, but I kind of spent some time in the thrall of a horrible curse that turned me against my fellow planeswalker. It wasn't a great look, but I'm all fixed up now. I'm curse-free and ready to show the world new Garrick. That's why I'm using Mac Weldon to build myself a new look. Now, I haven't worn a shirt in like uh, 12 years, so it's safe to say my wardrobe has been in dire need of an upgrade. Luckily, Mac Weldon makes looking good more approachable than ever. With a wide selection of wardrobe staples, Mac Weldon has helped me look more clean cut ugh, and stylish without having to spend too much money. Now, putting together a cool outfit is like second nature. And as a planeswalker, I'm big into loyalty. So I was thrilled to learn about Mac Weldon's loyalty program. At the first level, you'll get free shipping. And once you reach the second, you'll get a cool 20% off of everything you order for an entire year. Now, thanks to Mac Weldon, when people see me, they wave and say hi, instead of running and screaming. For 20% off your first order, visit MacWeldon.com slash knights and enter the promo code knights. That's knights with a K. Again, MacWeldon.com slash knights with promo code knights. When the Sun Titan dies, it's gonna trigger my commander. I will move to the next dungeon level, and I will scry one, but I do it twice because of Hama Pashar. Um, I like this card. I will put it on top of my library, and I'll scry one again, but I'll just leave that on top. And then I will tap three mana and activate my dungeon map. So I'm gonna move to the next room, and that's the Goblin Bazaar. And I'm going to create a treasure token, but do it twice because of Hama Pashar. Two treasures. And then I'm going to tap six total mana and cast Wand of Orcus and equip it to my command. Oh, that is one of the nastiest artifacts in all of d and Oh, cool. I wish I could have put this on a bigger creature because then I'd get a lot more zombies. But still, it's a pretty scary card and hopefully I can get some value out of it. And that's gonna do it for me. I'll pass turn to you, Becca. Okie dokie. I untap, draw for turn. All right, I'm gonna start with Wild Magic Sorcerer. Oh. Nice. Cascade is another mechanic that synergizes super well with Becca's commander. 
because it allows her to cast a card from exile, it's gonna trigger her commander and just start that whole thing over again. Becca's deck is functioning at a high level right now. With all this freaking land. You got a lot of manas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I will cast Shiny Impetus, and I'm gonna cast it onto Josh's commander. There you go, friend. Don't attack me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Josh's deck is a Voltron deck. He's gonna take one creature and make it super scary by adding a bunch of equipment and auras onto it. And I don't want that thing to ever come for me, so that's the thing I want to goad. So I'm actually not mad about this shiny impetus being put on my creature. I think Joe's the threat right now, and if I can, I'm more likely to go after him. And if later I want to be able to attack Becca with this, I can hopefully find a way to remove the curse at that point. Until then, I just have a bigger creature. And I cast that from exile, so I get a treasure token. Okay. And the first spell I cast from exile each turn has Cascade. Oh boy. Exile cards from the topic library until you exile a non-land card that costs less. Bag of Devouring, and I will cast it without paying its mana cost. Sweet. Bag of Devouring is pretty good in this deck, but it's gonna take a lot of time and mana to set up, so maybe if this game goes really long, I'll need it. Otherwise, I'm not gonna worry about it too much. And uh, because I cast it from Exile, I will get another treasure. Oh yeah. Wow, so much synergy. And then I will move to my instep. I will exile a card because of my commander. It is Hurl Through Hell. Yikes. That's bad. No bueno. I will pass turn. All right, I will untap, I will draw. Then I'm gonna look at the top card because of my commander. I can never find an equipment or aura there. I'm gonna start by tapping a white and I'm gonna play Griff's Boon, targeting my commander, nice. Galea. And that is an aura, so I'll draw off SRAM. So Galea is now a 7-6 Flying Vigilance. Look at the top card of my library. Oh, I found an aura. I will cast that aura. It is Eel Umbra. I guess it's a Voltron deck, so I will put that also onto Galea. Uh, and I will draw off of SRAM. I'm so glad it's goaded by me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I will look at the top card of my library to see if it's an aura. It is an aura, so I'll cast that off the top of my deck. Uh, it's shielding plaques. Wow. And I'm gonna target Galea. I draw a card for the shielding plaques, but I also draw a card for SRAM. Dang, okay. Man, 8-7 flying vigilant hexproof is pretty scary. So now I need to start trying to find an answer to this monstrosity. All right, then I'm gonna pay two and I'm gonna cast angelic gift on my SRAM. Whoa. Which just gives it flying, but I get to draw two cards, one for SRAM, one for the angelic gift. Sweet, bro. Then I'll look at the top card of my library because of my commander. It's not an aura. So I guess I will go to combat. And Jimmy, I'm sorry, but I will attack you with my 8-7 flying vigilant commander. Josh, my ventral ancestor triggers, and Galea will do one point of damage to you. Oh, right, because, because she it's, it's goaded, yeah. She's turning on you. Okay, I take one and go to 20. Shiny impetus. I shall make a treasure. Nice. All right, Jimmy, and then we will go to blocks. Well, I don't have any flyers, so I'm gonna go ahead and take eight damage and go to 22. And that's commander damage. That is commander damage. I go to 22 life here, but the important thing is that I now have 12 commander damage from Josh. That means next turn, all he has to do is add one more power to that thing, and if it hits me, I'm just out of this game. I'm gonna have to either get some flying blockers up or find a way to divert Josh's attention away from me. And then I'm gonna do one more thing here, which is play a soul ring. The classic turn 10 soul <laughs> ring. Nice. I suppose there's no reason not to just suit my SRAM up with the swift foot boots so that it also has hexproof. All right, and that is all I can do, Joe. It's all you. End step. I'd like to use my component pouch. Oh. To roll a d20. Yeah. A crit, a natty 20, wow. wow. So what you happens? Put two component counters on my component pouch. So there we go, bang. Okay, I see how you're an expert at D&D. That, that was a crit. It doesn't matter that much that I get extra counters on it. That component pouch, I'm using it to roll dice so I can keep creating 5-4 dragons. And because I rolled a die, Vrondis oh. starts raging oh. and takes one point of damage to himself and creates a 5-4 dragon spirit. Very cool. 
<laughs> Josh, do you have to discard? Oh yeah, I do have to discard. Thank you for pointing that out. I have 10 cards, so I will discard three cards. All you, man. Okay, untap. Now, because of Colossal Majesty, I will draw. And I will draw for turn. Okay. I'm going to play Wolfgar of Icewind Dale. Wolfgar! How cool. Shout out to Bob Salvatore. First of all, I grew up reading the R.A. Salvatore Driss books, so seeing Wolfgar on the battlefield is really, really cool. Also, he's very scary. He can become a 10-10 just based on what Joe has on the board. The double attack triggers is also pretty strong. At the very least right now, that means two goads per turn, so the amount of value here is crazy. I'm going to cast Sword of Hours. Oh. Nice. This sword has an attack trigger on it, so it works beautifully with Wolfgar. Instead of adding one counter per combat, Joe's gonna add two and have a chance of potentially doubling that. Plus, when he rolls the dice, he's gonna make a 5-4, so lots of bad things happening right now. I'm gonna equip it onto my Thunderbreak Regent. I will go to combat. Wait, before you go to combat, I would like to cast Hurl Through Hell from Exile. Wow, nice. I have a really big decision here with Hurl Through Hell. I can steal Wolfgar so he doesn't get two triggers off of the equipment. Or do I kill the flyer that has the sword on it, but then it's gonna deal three damage to me when I take it? Tough decision. And I would like to cast it upon your oh. Wolfgar of the Icewind Dale. Come on. Goodbye, Wolfgar. And until the end of my next turn, I can cast that card, but I have to do it during my turn. Yeah. Because I cast a card from Exile, my commander will trigger, and I will make a treasure. Nice. And I'm going to Cascade because of Wild Magic Sorcerer. All right. So uh, it's less than four. Okay, we got Is It Chemister? And because I cast it from Exile, I get one more treasure. A lot of value. Jimmy, mm -hmm. I am attacking you with Thunderbreak Regent and Vengeful Ancestor, my two flyers. Both? And Becca, I am attacking you with Dragon Spirit. On attack, the Sword of Hours triggers, which then puts a 1-1 counter on my Thunderbreak Regent. Uh, with my Vengeful Ancestor, I will go the Wild Magic Sorcerer. Consider him goaded. I don't have any flyers, so no blocks. Becca, you have a 5-4 coming at you. I love this Is It Chemister, but I think I'm going to block. All right, so let's go to damage. I will take eight and go to 14. And then my Is It Chemister dies. Ugh. That triggers the Sword of Hours die roll, which I need a D12 for. Do you have a D12, Joe? I just so happen to have a D12, <laughs> and I'm so glad that it's getting used. Sword of the Hours, the beauty of its mechanics is that I get to roll the D12, which is like the most unused dice in all of Dungeons and Dragons. Six or higher, and it doubles the amount of counters on it? Yeah. Come on. Ah, okay. no. You know, I had a better than 50% chance to roll to double the plus one counters, but I rolled a one. Worst possible scenario for the trigger. Uh, so my dragon spirit is sacrificed, but because I rolled a die, Rhonda starts raging and another dragon spirit takes his place. I will go to my end step, which means I get to draw a card. He's still the monarch. Who is going to knock off Joe's crown because... It really feels like he's catapulted to the lead here. Things are just getting out of control on that part of the board. Okay, I will untap and draw my card for the turn. I'll play a land for turn. All right, I'm going to venture into the dungeon. So this is going to move into the lost level, which allows me to scry two, and I'll do it twice because of Hama Pashar. I will put one on top of my library and the other on the bottom, and then I'm going to scry two again. I will put one on top of my library and the other on the bottom. So one card is good. Uh, I am then going to tap five mana, and I will play a Karmic Guide. Oh. When it enters the battlefield, I can return a creature card from my graveyard to the battlefield, and here he comes once more. This looks like a job for Sun Titan! <laughs> uh, and Sun Titan is going to target my soul ring. Good job, Sun Titan. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. Karma Guide is nice in this situation because it does get some stuff back and I get a little bit of value, but more importantly, it's a flyer. And it's a flyer that can block Josh's commander. And that's the main thing I need right now. Then I will pass the turn back to you, Becca. Okay, uh, before you do, on your end step, I would like to cast Commune with Lava. 
I will sack all my treasure to do it. So X is equal to what? Four? X equals four. My hand is near empty. I really need to refill it. So getting to exile a bunch of stuff and then cast it at the beginning of my next turn, it's gonna keep me in this game. And so I will exile the top four cards of my library. Oh, pretty good. Ugh, Becca just revealed some really scary cards off the top of her library. And one of them gets rid of a lot of life on top of everything else. My hope is that she's looking at Josh and Joe. They are very scary, and compared to me, I don't have anything really going on. Okay, I untap everything, and I draw for turn. Okay, first thing, I will play the mountain from Exile, which will gain me a treasure token. Man, I like this Prosper, it's oh, pretty cool. God. And then I will pay seven mana and cast Phythesis. Oh boy. What are you gonna kill? When I saw the Phythesis, I was scared for like half a second and then I realized all my stuff has Hexproof so she can't target me. So eh, this can't go bad for me, pick whatever you want. You've got a Sun Titan. What's your biggest power couple? You have nine. Life. Look, I want to do as much damage as possible with this Phythesis. The Sun Titan has the biggest power and toughness of anything on the board, and Jimmy's life total is pretty low. I just gotta go for him. I will target Jimmy's Sun Titan. Oh, man. <laughs> Sun Titan is going to die. And that means I lose 12 life. And that's gonna bring me down to two total. Wow. Ouch. Oh no. Becca destroys my Sun Titan and deals 12 damage to me. I'm at two. I'm dead on board to either Joe or Josh. So what are the chances I get another turn here? And now with Jimmy, my dragons are smelling blood. On that cast, I have two triggers. I'll create a treasure token from Prosper. <laughs> And then I will cascade because of my wild magic sorcerer. Here we go, and I guess I got a soul ring. A lot of late game soul rings coming out here. Mm -hmm. When I cast that soul ring, I get another treasure token. Sweet. And then, because a creature entered my graveyard, I'm gonna move to the next room in the dungeon, so I'm going to the runestone caverns. I get to exile the top two cards of my library and I may play them, but I get to do it twice because of Hama Pashar. But strange as it may sound, I don't actually want to play any of them, so I will let them go to exile. Then I will cast Wolfgar of Icewind Dale. Sure. I don't mind. That's cool. Now Becky cast my Wolfgar, which kind of upsets me because I wanted to use him. That's gonna create a treasure token. Right, because he cast it from exile. Oh, he cast from exile. And then he looks lonely without anybody with an attacking trigger. So I'm gonna cast the tectonic giant to keep him company. That makes another treasure. This worked out really well for me. I stole a card that doubles attack triggers, and now I have a card to play that has attack triggers. Now I just hope I get the opportunity to attack. And I'll burn two more treasure to cast the Dark Dweller Oracle from Exile. When I do, it creates a treasure token. So Becca's deck being pretty resilient here and able to bounce back, and she's right back in this game with all those cards she got off the Commune with Lava. My Wild Magic Sorcerer is goaded, so I'm gonna swing at you, Jimmy. Okay, uh, I'm gonna block it with my commander, and it has Death Touch. Goodbye, you sweet cascading baby. And my commander will die. I will just, I'll put it in my graveyard for now. Who knows, maybe I can get it back. Okay, that's interesting. And because the goaded creature attacked, it deals one damage to its controller. I'm now 20. And then I will move to my end step, where I will exile a card because of my commander. Dream Pillager. I think at this point in the game, the three of us other than Jimmy are looking at each other, trying to figure out who's got the edge. I'm confident I have a lot of creatures, but with Becca's ability to develop creatures and spells and with Josh's flying, vigilant, juiced up, impossible to take down commander, I realize I gotta watch my stuff. Past turn. Okay. I untap all this, and then I will go and I will draw my card for the turn. All right, I will look at the top card. It's not an aura. I'm gonna start by casting Serum Visions, which will allow me to draw a card and then scry two. I'll put them back like that. Uh, then I'll look at the top card in my library to see if it is an aura and equipment. Oh, look, it is. It's Curse of Verbosity. Sure. It's a tough choice here who to enchant with this curse. It's obviously not Jimmy, because he's gonna die. The problem with Joe is I have trouble attacking him and I wanna draw the cards myself. So I think I gotta put it on Becca, sorry. So here you go, Becca, that's that's attached to you now. You're a little bit cursed. Come on. Then I'm going to tap five, and I'm gonna cast Prognostic Sphinx. Ooh. I'm gonna pay one mana, and I'm gonna move my Swiftfoot Boots over to the Sphinx. 
So I have a 3-5 flyer that can attack this turn. That's bad. I'm gonna go to combat, and I'm gonna swing Galea at you, Joe. Sram is coming at you, Becca. And Prognostic Sphinx is coming at Jimmy. I could take Jimmy out here, but I think it's actually better to just remove his blocker and then require Joe to do the last bit of work. Because any resource Joe throws at Jimmy is one that's not coming against me. There's a couple of triggers on the attack. My ventral ancestor triggers. Yep, I'll take one shiny impetus. I shall make a treasure. Not bad at all. And then prognostic sphinx, I get to scry three. I put all three on the bottom and curse of verbosity will trigger. So I will draw a card and then let us go to blocks. I can't block. Okay. Um, I will block with my karmic guide. I will not block. Okay, we go to damage. I have no choice but to take eight. Down to 25. My karmic guide will chump and it will die. Yep. I will take four damage and go to 16. Oh. Okay. It's just a true spreading of the love. And uh, you now are the monarch. Okay, I become the monarch because I dealt combat damage to you. Now, I'm at 25 life, but I'm at 13 commander damage from Josh, which means that one more hit with his flying, winged, vigilant commander, and I'm out of the game. So I've got to find an answer immediately. Second main phase, I'm going to cast an arcane signet. <laughs> And then I will pass the turn, draw my card from the mark. So now I'm feeling a little bit better. Jimmy now has two life. And Joe, who is the scariest player currently on the table, if I can find a way to sneak my commander in, it could be lights out. I think I have a chance to win this game. End step, I'm going to, with my component pouch, I'm gonna roll a d20. Okay, let's see what we get. 18, that's a dot over the eight. Okay, 18. Two component counters on the component pouch. Also, it triggers Vrondis, and another dragon spirit shows up. Yikes. And uh, my turn, so yep. I'll untap. I will draw, because of Colossal Majesty, which is actually, funny <laughs> enough, my nickname in high school. And I will draw my card for the turn. I'm going to play Shamanic Revelation. <laughs> oh, boy. Amazing. So you're gonna draw seven, and then how many creatures are power four greater? Four creatures, which means I gain 16 life. <laughs> No. Uh-oh. 41 life? That's more than he started with. I'm really counting on Josh's commander damage. <laughs> I'm gonna tap a mountain and drop a soul ring. So I'm thinking to myself, I still have to find an answer for Josh. I could be at a thousand life, but I'm still going to die from one hit from his commander. Um, interesting, interesting. So I do some soul searching and I realize that I don't have creature removal, but I do have player removal. Oh, 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 wait. Uh-oh. I will move to combat. Okay. Jimmy, I am attacking you with Dragon Speaker I, Shaman okay. and Neverwinter Hydra. Josh, I am attacking you with the Dragon Spirits and these two. And both other flying dragons? Correct. Okay. On attack, the Sword of Hours activates, which then puts a 1-1 counter on my Thunderbreak region. Okay, so it's a 6-6 six, six now? 6-6, six, six, correct. And? On that attack, Vengeful Ancestor will trigger and will goad my old friend Wolfgar. Hmm, this attack makes me nervous because it doesn't make a ton of sense. It's gonna knock Jimmy out, but it's not enough to kill me. And I would think he would want to keep some blockers back so that he doesn't die to my commander. So what's going on? Okay, let's go to blocks. Um, I will block your 2-2 Trampler with my Hama Pashar, that's 2-3. I will block the 6-6 six, six Flyer with Galia, my 8-7 Flyer. And that's it? Those are the blocks. I Decree of Savagery. Whoa. What? Uh, so now I'm definitely gonna die. That's plus four, plus four permanently to all of his creatures. It's a lot more damage than I have life. So, put four 1-1 one, one counters on each creature I control. Oh. Joe just added like 30,000 power to the board, so looks like we're both very dead. Jimmy, you got any effects? I can't do anything. Well, let's go to damage. I'm gonna take nine damage and promptly die. And then I died to a savage amount of plus one, plus one counters and creatures. And then I'm gonna take 25. I'm only at 19 lives. Oh. And then I die to an army of super buff dragons. No, no, ah! 
Not only did Joe just kill the other opponents, but he also made all of his creatures permanently huge, and I thought my one chance of getting him was having Josh kill him with commander damage. All right, and because I'm out of the game now, I'm sorry, Becca, but I have to take back my winged boots and, well, the curse you want gone, but the winged boots, I'm sure you want it, sorry. I really like those boots. And then, because of Sword of Hours and my Decree of Savagery, I now have to roll an 11 or 12 to activate the special ability. Savage, right. dude. Okay. So it gets so. six more counters? Six more. Jeez. And my other dragon spirits die and are replaced with one who has got to hit the gym, clearly. Yeah, I got to hit the gym. Uh, also, I was the monarch and you oh. dealt damage to me, so you uh, are now the monarch. Dragon High yes. Lord, welcome! Yes. I'm going to go to end step because I am the dragon High Lord again. I will draw. I'm going to go to my discard phase. I have 11 cards, so I'm going to discard four. Wow, rough life. Worth noting, I am discarding anger. Creatures I control have haste. Wow. Okay. So at the end of this turn, I'm at 41 life. I've killed two of my opponents, and my dragon army is now super buff. I'm feeling pretty confident because it's now my game to lose. I shall untap. My only way out here is a board wipe, so I'm just gonna do anything I can to look at as many cards as possible. Draw for turn. Is it the big winner? No. Ugh. So I'm gonna use my Mind Stone, sack it, and draw a card. Uh, and then I will pay two mana to sack the Felwar Stone to the Bag of Devouring to draw a card. All I need is a board wipe, come on. I will pay one. I will activate my Dark Dweller Oracle and sack Wolfgar. Wow. I exile the top card of my library. I can play that card this turn. It's a bajuka bog. Hmm. A lot of lands. So now as Becca is drawing card after card that's not helping her, I'm starting to feel like a cat that's just playing with its food. Let's go ahead and cast this Dream Pillager here. That'll create a treasure token. Sure. I'm looking at Joe's board and I'm doing the math and I have enough blockers that I can maybe live for one more turn, so I'm gonna stop sacrificing stuff, hope that I live, and maybe get one more chance at this. I'm gonna pass to my instep, and Prosper is going to exile a card. Oh, a Beholder. Yeah, you a got a Beholder. If I live, I'll get to play it. <laughs> pass turn. Okay, untap. I've got her on the ropes, but any card she could draw off of the deck could take me out and turn the tide. I've got to finish this now. Because of Colossal Majesty, I will draw. Then I will draw for turn. To start out, do I'm your go, worst. Well, I will play Clouth, Unrivaled Ancient. My ancient red dragon. In the 86 World Series against the Mets, they put Bill Buckner out on first base, and we all know how that went, but imagine if that would have gone right. They wanted to put him on the field so that he could run up and win a championship and be on the field for it. I wanted my ancient red dragon on the field for the victory lap. <laughs> <laughs> and now I will Magma Coy. X is equal to four. This destroys most of my blockers. My one out here is to sacrifice stuff to draw cards, so let's do it. So with that on the stack, because I have a lot of options here and I really think I could pull this thing through, uh, I'm going to activate Dark Dweller Oracle and sack my Tectonic Giant for one. And on top of my library, we got Dance Macabre. That's not good. Let's sack my commander since he's gonna die anyway. Hey, one. Becca's doing the smart thing here. She's playing to her outs. She's sacking pieces of her board to draw or look at more cards. So it's a long shot, but she's not 100% dead yet. I exile the top card of my library. I can play that card this turn. Oh. That's a land. Look at that lovely land that's exiled there. And you know what? It's gonna sack itself. Yeah, sure. Okay, we got a oh, swamp. You love no. to see it. You love to, you see, love it to see it if you you're Joe. Okay, so I didn't get anything. Now I am dead on board. He can just swing in and kill me. Okay, and then Magma Quake resolves. Yes, my dragon spirit is on the ground and is 5-4, so it dies. But because Vrondis took damage as well, a dragon spirit shows up. And he has haste because of the anger. That's and pretty cool. Now, Vrondis can lead my dragon army to victory. 
Feels like it's all over but the crying here. Okay, so I send my entire force at you. First, I will sack my last four treasure, and then I say good game, good game. Well done, well done. <laughs> good game, good game, good game. And then I died to an army of dragons, and they lift me up and rip my body into a million pieces. <sighs> So I swing through with my dragon army and win the game. Onward to Avernus, victorious. These pre-cons were so much fun to play. Wizards of the Coast has gotten so good at designing these commander sets that you never feel like you're out of the game when you're playing them. My deck was super sweet. I know I didn't win, but I felt like I had a lot of opportunities to show it doing really cool stuff. I'm so happy to see Dungeons and Dragons, something that means so much to me, and Magic, which I played in high school when it first came out, blends so well together. It's so great to be able to tap mana and have a famous character from Dungeons and Dragons come out, or one of those mythic legendary items on your battlefield. For me, magic and D&D both activate parts of my brain that I really love to use, and getting to play my two favorite games together was super special. I think the line between magic and D&D is just gonna blur, and I think that everybody's just gonna do both. I mean, why wouldn't you? If you're attracted to one, why wouldn't you be attracted to the other? At the end of the day, it really is about the same stuff. Hanging out around the table with your friends, transporting yourself into a new world, and putting on silly, goofy voices. You don't need to do funny voices if you don't want to. This is, should be a Illegal. <laughs> All right, you made it to the nice. end of the episode. Congratulations to Joe. Good job. I definitely got run over by a whole bunch of dragons there. Yeah, we got Rondist out. Very fitting for someone like Joe as well. He is definitely a dragon lover. And huge thanks to Becca Scott. Mm -hmm. You know, she played a really cool deck and Prosper, complicated to play. The sequencing for that uh, commander is not easy, but she did make it look easy. Yeah. Uh, but you get a lot of value if you do it right. I was, I was impressed. Yeah, if you are a Rakdos lover, this commander is awesome. So make sure you check that deck out. Uh, and another thing you should check out is our sponsor, Ultra Pro. You know, they make all of the play mats, the sleeves, the deck boxes that you see on all of our content mm -hmm. that makes our battlefield look completely thematic. So cool. Properly adorned, mm -hmm. you know, so that your opponents go, ooh, ah. You know, the 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 artwork from Forgotten Realms is from D&D, &D, and it's so rich and has so much history behind it. And being able to get that onto your card sleeves and your playmats, you know, I think that's something that a lot of people have been waiting for for decades and decades. Yeah. So Ultra Pro really does have the licensing agreement with Wizards to be able to bring all that artwork to life on your other game pieces. Yeah, and they're the only people that do it. So the next time you're at your local game store or over at Card Kingdom, you can pick up some Ultra Pro product and just make your gaming experience that much better. And speaking of making your game experience that much better, you might want to win some Ultra Pro product. In fact, you might win that playmat that Joe and Becca signed. And if you want to do that, there are three ways to enter. The first is on Twitter. Just go and tweet out to the hashtag Game Nights and make sure you link to this episode and you'll be entered that way. If you're on Facebook, navigate your way to our Facebook page, find the post that we posted for this episode, and in the comments below, tag a friend, tag a bestie, someone that you might think wants to watch the episode, and you'll be entered that way. And if you're on Instagram, it's super simple. Just use the hashtag Game Nights and post whatever you want. Now, you only have one week from the release date of this episode to enter, so make sure you have three chances now, and you can enter all three ways if you want but you have until one week after this episode releases and then we'll announce the winners on those platforms. Yeah, every single time we do this, somebody uh, uses the hashtag or whatever, like four weeks after the episodes come out, we've already announced the winners. Once they're announced, you can't enter to win anymore. You gotta wait till the next episode of Game Nights. Yep. Uh, speaking of the next episode, not of Game Nights, but of extra turns, uh, in about a week from the release of this episode, about the time that that uh, giveaway contest is ending, we are going to release extra turns. And on this episode of extra turns, we have the budget up upgrades to these pre-con commander decks from Forgotten Realms. If you've been following the podcast over the last uh, few weeks, you've seen our team members here at the Command Zone, DJ mm -hmm. also, walking through their $30 budget upgrades for each of these pre-cons. Yeah, it's Lady, it's Craig, it's Jake, and DJ. Ah. And they are going to be seeing who did the best upgrades. So uh, if you want to find out you know, what happens in that game, well, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you know right when that episode comes out. Yeah, and again, patrons at patreon.com slash command zone do get to see the episode a day early. So again, if you like the content, if it's brought you any amount of enjoyment, as little as a dollar a month, you can go and support that way and watch these episodes a day early. All right, everybody. Thanks for sticking around and thanks for supporting our show. And we'll see you next time.